Hey, I'm Alex Mackle from Board Game Co, and today I'm reviewing Bebop from Bitewing Games. Bebop is a two to four player area control music themed game that currently is on Kickstarter. I'll have a link to everything down below, and of course, prototype all rules and components subject to change. The basic idea of Bebop is it's area control tile placement, because instead of tiles, it's dice, although you also do have tiles, so the dice go into those tiles. It's a little bit confusing to go ahead and get into, but I'll try just taking a few turns and then explaining things as you go. The core gameplay itself, that's actually very simple and straightforward. The core gameplay is on your turn, you are either reserving a seat or placing a person in that seat, the people being dice. That's all you're doing. Reserve a seat, place a person in the seat, that's basically all you do on your turns. To that end, you're going to have a bunch of basic seats in the game, and you have basic seats and special seats, we'll focus on the basic seats for right now. You're going to take a basic seat and put it down anywhere on the board. So for example, I think over here might be a particularly good spot, I'm going to grab that seat over there. Okay, I'm going to lock that seat in. Then from there, because I just want to unlock that in, maybe somebody else goes ahead and responds on their turn, they'll take this seat, let's grab a basic seat for them. We have a basic seat for this player. Maybe they want to go ahead and lock in some other connecting point. Maybe that spot over there could be useful because of the nature of having these two together. And then the next player goes ahead and they actually want to get in on this little seat selection. So they're going to go ahead and drop a seat over there. And we are set up as a three player game right now. So we'll just go ahead and continue going as we go. Now, once a seat is out, because on the first turn, the only thing you can do is place a seat. Once the seat's out on your next turn, you can either place another seat or you can start placing a die. Each player has three dice in front of them. These are the three dice they have. And then whenever you place a die, you're going to refill it either from the bag or from the available seats over here, the available people in the queue. So to that end, let's go ahead and place another seat. We're not ready to lock in just yet. And in fact, what I'll go ahead and do if I can find over here is I'll actually place my VIP seat. Although you have to give me a second to find it because we have special seats over here. So give me a second here. We got this one, we got that one. I got most of my special seats, but not all of them. Where is our VIP seat? Not this one. Here we go. We got this, 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 and over here. Here we go. We got our VIP seat over here. It has a little star in it. We're actually going to go ahead and place this VIP seat down over here. Now, that's an early play, but I want to go ahead and show you some abilities, so that's what I'm going to do right now. Now, the VIP seat can go on a VIP spot, whereas other seats cannot go on those spots. So it gives you a little more flexibility, because you'll see a lot of sections of the board do have VIP seats. It's also worth noting, I'm set up for a three-player game over here which means this section over here is not in play. We have this, this, and this sections all in play as we go through it. So we have these areas set up. We have the, the board situation over there. And to that end, we're going to go ahead and do is we place our VIP seat back to the next person. They're gonna go ahead and grab one of their seats and they'll go ahead and start getting in on the game over here. Maybe they'll start locking in over here because they're, they're starting to see a pattern emerge and they wanna get in on it. And we'll have blue place another seat and blue will actually start an entirely new area locking down a spot over there. It comes back to uh, white over here. White is going to go ahead and place a person this time. This time around, white's going to, let's actually give white some dice because I realized I set up for three for two players, but not for three. Let's grab our starting dice over here. Here we go, here's our starting dice. We're going to go ahead and take this seat over here and place it down over here like so. And the reason for that is because you'll see this seat over here, this person is going to connect to those ranges over there. So they're going to want to listen to that music. All of these little things over here are stages. You have one, two, and three person stages, and you're trying to surround those stages with people who want to listen to that type of music. So that's going to be a helpful die because it both surrounds this one and this one. It moves to Black's turn. Black's over here has got this seat over here. They want to get in on that game, so they're going to go ahead and grab a seat. They're actually going to use one of their special seats as well, if I can find it, which is their instant placement die over here, which I have to find that one over here. And they have a seat. Now what they're going to do is they're going to instantly place one of their dice into the seat because that's one of the special dice that you have. So over here, we got this one over here. This one's going to go ahead and enable you to place a seat right now and instantly place a die into that seat, which is going to have an impact. You see, they're seeing that right now, they're seeing that white is gearing up to place more to more people in this seat over here, and they don't want that to happen, so they're going to go right now and they're going to close that seat out. By the way, on White's turn, I forgot to do it, but White has these dice over here. They need to refill, and they're actually going to grab this seat over here and take it, and then we're going to draw from the bag and re-roll. So we got that. This goes over here. So now White over here is gearing up two places, which would be helpful, and Black doesn't want any of that. They're immediately using one of their special seats to go ahead and instantly place, and basically taking two actions at once: place a seat and fill that seat with a die. Again, these are very early moves to be doing stuff like this, but I'm trying to show you different things going on. So they went ahead and did that. And that means right now, this seat over here is completely stage is completely surrounded. More specifically, stages are considered surrounded when they have only a, a, a VIP seats open. Basically, the seat over here, all the basic seats available are completely filled. So even though these spots actually do have the capability to put dice in them, as soon as the basic spots are filled, the stage resolves. And the way that works is right now, 
for this stage, you look at all the players who have those dice around the stage. In this case, white has one dice and black has one die around the stage, matching that particular stage type. Which means you're going to look at this board over here, and you're going to see that currently, you're going to see that's 10 points for that. They're each going to get 5 points, so you're going to move each of those up 5 points over here. Let's leave blue behind, going to 5. But the reason black did that is, first of all, they stopped white from being able to place another die, because had this die been here, then white would have resolved it, because they would have more of that symbol matching the stage. So black's trying to get ahead of the game there. But additionally, because it resolved, whenever there's a tie, someone's also going to get the token. And tokens are useful for end game scoring. Now, whoever usually resolves the most points will get the token, but whenever there's a tie, the active player, in this case black, they get the token over here. So, by the way, for whatever it's worth, despite the uh, slightly aggressive plays we're doing early on, they're not even bad plays to be able to lock in certain benefits in the game. It's a little more aggressive because you're targeting people who you don't even know are ahead yet, so you want to be a little free and try to see how the board plays out before really spending your extra moves, but you're getting a sense of how things play. Now that stage is resolved, uh, both of them got 5 points, Black got the token, which will be helpful for endgame scoring, and we lowered the uh, scoring on this by 1, because they're each going to go lower and lower and lower as you progress through the game, scoring fewer and fewer points, which means getting, getting in on those early is another big part of the game. Now it's gone, going on to Blue's turn, Blue is going to go ahead and place a seat as well. So Blue, Blue's going to place a seat uh, to lock in one more spot on the board, so let's go ahead and place this, we'll just go ahead and place this down over here. Now when it gets to Blue's turn again, they have three seats on the board. Whenever you have three open seats, you must b book a seat instead, placing a die into that seat. So your options are either booking a, seat, uh, booking a seat or filling that seat, and whenever you have three open seats, you have to fill the seat as your next action. You can never have more than, you can never go to four empty seats on the board at any given time. That's basically the core idea of how you score things in game. So there's a few things you haven't gotten to yet because there's a bunch of other elements, but scoring a stage, a stage is going to score whenever it's completely surrounded by regular seats, not VIP seats. And when that happens, you'll score points to whoever has the most symbols of that type connected to that stage, but, and here is a big but that it does get a little confusing. So let's go ahead and grab some dice to just show you how this plays out. Let's pretend blue has this die over here and this die over here. When this stage resolves, this die is going to count towards that the res resolution, but so is this one. And that might be confusing to you because you're looking at this and saying, this die doesn't touch this stage. But what it does do is it's next to a family. It's part of a family. All dice of the same color are considered a family. And so anything that's connected to a stage through a family is going to be part of the resolution of that stage. And yes, that includes even if this were a different die. Meaning even if this were not, well actually that's not the right example over here. Let's try to, let's try to swap some things around so we can show you this over here. Let's pretend that the situation were like this, okay? Like over here, like so. Even though on this stage, nobody cares about the piano right now, no one cares about that, because they do care about the trumpets, this guy cares about the trumpet, and it's connected through an existing family, this trumpet will help resolve this stage over here. That's basically the way that plays out. Connected families are going to be helpful in terms of determining that control, which also means that as the board fills out, there's lots of room for trying to connect different things. And yes, another thing worth mentioning, it doesn't matter who actually owns that seat. Connecting families are connecting families regardless of who booked that seat. If you booked Joe and uh, your friend booked uh, his sister Jane, they're still together even though different people are responsible for the booking of the seats. So you get points for the booking of the seats, but nonetheless, so even in this example, where it's not even the same person, the player who has them connected, this is still going to score for that stage. Not only that, but as you place things on the board, you're going to get points for placing things in, in connected families. So when a player places this over here, it's part of an existing family, so it's going to score points. Now the amount of points you score is equal to the number of people in that family with that symbol. So for right now, you would score one point for blue. Now if blue places another one over here, because it's part of this existing family, it'll score points, but this time it scores two points because you have two trumpets in that particular uh, grouping family. So now we have two ways of scoring points. You score points whenever you place a die that's part of a family. You also score points whenever you resolve a stage, looking at that particular symbol on the stage. If it has multiple symbols, you're going to go through them one at a time, assigning points to anything touching the stage and anything connected to the stage through connecting families that might be relevant for scoring. And the last thing you do in the game is going to be end game scoring, which is a little bit complicated, but I'll try to do the best I can. We're going to grab a bunch of these tokens over here. Let's pretend we have this token, this token, and um, let's just go with that over here. Let's pretend we have these tokens over here, and let's go ahead and get, get one more situation over here. Let's place this down over here and grab a die from the bag so we can show you some end game scoring because it is a little confusing. But over here we got, you know what, actually let's go ahead and place white over here like so. There we go. 
So in endgame scoring, the way this is going to work is you're going to look at the largest family of each dice. Basically, as you place dice, whenever you create a family, a grouping, if it is currently the largest family or tied for the largest family, you're going to give it this indicator to go ahead and show that that is currently the largest family for that grouping of dice. And the largest family of each grouping of dice at the end of the game is going to score points based on the tokens you've collected. The way that works is you're going to look, let's pretend right now, let's grab a few tokens over here and just say, this is, uh, this is white's tokens over here, and let's pretend this is uh, black's tokens over here, and let's grab a few more tokens from over here and pretend these are blues tokens over here at the end of the game. The way that's going to work is you're going to look at the largest family and each instrument that scores. In this particular family, you'll see that percussion doesn't score at all, so you can ignore that. No one's going to score for their percussion tokens. Whereas if you look at trumpets, blue clearly has the most trumpets with two trumpets over there. So blue is going to look at their trumpets and they're going to get one point because they have one trumpet. Had they had a few more trumpets, let's go ahead and give them a few more over here, they'd get points for each of the trumpets that they had because they score the most trumpets. So each of the largest families is going to score points for each of the symbols in that family. So right now blue would get three points. In the case of these over here, you have black and white tied for the piano over there, which means each of them are going to score, the ties are friendly in this case, so black's going to score three points and white's going to score one point, even though they're tied, the amount of points they score is different depending on the control that they've gathered from those tokens across the course of the game. That's basically how you play the game. You're going to go ahead and place seats or book seats and place dice in those seats. You're going to resolve that until you completely run out of your seats. You have your, I believe it's 16, I have to double check the numbers, it might be 11 basic seats, I have to double check, double check the numbers. You have a bunch of basic seats and then you have five special seats. The five special seats you have are one special seat that's a VIP seat that lets you go into all these multiple VIP spots. You have one seat that has to go, it's a backstage, a backstage pass, it goes on the stage that has already been scored, letting you connect through stages when you otherwise can't. You have a special seat that lets you kick out somebody's seat that hasn't yet been uh, had a die placed in it and then you have a special seat that lets you immediately book another seat or a seat that lets you immediately place a die into the seat those are the special abilities you have in the game and that's basically how you play bebop although there's some more things going on i don't want to show you everything because i don't want to mess up this board over here but there are four different boards in the game giving you different configurations of how to play so i'm not going to show you what's on the back of the uh, board on the table but we have this one over here which is another way to go ahead and score another way to try to be mindful of the different ways you're going to connect things and then over here on the other side we have this one which is going to be a lot of connecting over here a wide open center base so you can have different layouts and formats as far as how you can go ahead and try to score as much as possible in the game or not score how to how to approach the game differently with the same general rules as you go through the experience and with that let's talk about my opinion of the game starting off with ease of play let's get into the re review part starting off with ease of play uh, the rules in this one are incredibly simple in terms of the rules themselves the, the short, short rule book maybe four or five pages very simple rules the problem is i find it's not intuitive i try to go into as much information this is a longer how to play section than i normally do because frankly i find it's harder to teach people how to play the game and you really need to set up as many examples as possible and often as i've played this uh with my experience playing this game i have found that it's one that I have found that's one that you really need to see things resolved to fully understand how things are connected, how the families work, when you score points for placing a family, how families are connected to stages, the end game as well, I find often takes people by surprise, even if you've taught them how it works, it's still like, oh, now it's all coming together as you play it. I find this is really not intuitive as far as what's happening or how things connect together, but the actual game rules are fairly straightforward. There are these handy player aids that, depending on your player count, at two player they actually use to just to uh, hide your dice, but at higher player counts, these are just used to go ahead and give you the information you need, and the information itself, again, the rules are fairly you can include all the information you need for the game on this player aid, but the understanding and comprehension of those rules is a different level. I do find this is not the most intuitive game to, uh, to understand what's happening as you're doing it. As far as what I like, don't like, and can see others not liking, oh, and game time is like 45 minutes, maybe an hour. It's a fairly quick moving game overall. As far as what I like, don't like, and can see others not liking, starting off with what I like, there's lots of room for clever plays in this game. You are limited by the dice you have, which starts off random, and even as you go, you have a limited pool of whatever's on the stage over there. You can always draw from the bag, but then you're gonna be drawing a completely random die at a completely random color and rolling it and seeing if it fits to your strategy. So you are definitely limited by the dice to some extent, but past that, there's a lot of clever play opportunities as you try to look on the board, look at the developing families, look at the stages in question, try to figure out which chain of dice are gonna be relevant to which place, and then as you try to figure out the right sequence of actions. Placing a seat kind of gives things away, as to as far as what your strategy is, but you have to do so. Similar to what you saw in that very first turn where I went ahead and reserved the seat, my goal, just in case you want to know strategically, my goal is to connect a chain of percussion over here to be able to go ahead and get one more seat over here 
Because if I can do that, if I can get another percussion over here, even if it's not the right symbol, at that point, these two percussions are helping for this stage, for this stage, and for this stage. And you know what? If another person places a purple die over here, maybe I use my kick out seat over here and boot the person's seat out and maybe slowly connect another chain of, of dice over here down to here, then I can go ahead and start scoring for those as well. And suddenly you have over here, these percussions are for this, for this, for this. You also have this trumpet. This trumpet's still connected to this. You can start creating those chains. The problem is Black saw that because I'm also playing as Black and was able to stop that by using a special die to immediately place the die as I go. I've used one of my abilities, but there's a lot of that back and forth. There's a lot of clever placement, both in terms of trying to set yourself up for the way you're going to try to chain things together and score points, not, not just for the stages themselves. Keep in mind, every time I place a die there, I got a bunch of extra points because I got one point for the first percussion, two for the second, three for the third, four for the fourth. That's 10 extra points in the game just from placing the dice, let alone the actual scoring of the stages or the fact that I'm also creating the largest purple family, which means I really want to try to get as many percussion across the course of the game as, as I can because I'm going to be scoring for percussion in purple and I want to try to lock in those percussion uh, in other dice families as well. So there is a lot to think about as you try to set yourself up for success and as you try to figure out which abilities are going to help you, what other players are doing, who to get in the way of as you go, there's a lot of room for clever players as you go through this. Chaining families is very satisfying. Using different abilities is very satisfying. The tension of the fact that as you go through the game, this scoring track is moving lower and lower as you go, which means you start off by scoring 10 points for that first stage you clear for each of the symbols of that type, uh, for each of the instrument types. But as the game goes on, you'll be scoring towards the end, you'll be scoring maybe two or three points. You Because you technically could go as low as one, but I find that for the most part, the, the game ends once all players are out of dice, regardless of what's resolved on the board. So not everything will score. But the difference between scoring 10 points for an early or early stage that you scored versus scoring two points means you want to get things early. So you're not just thinking through how to set things up for the future, but how to immediately cash in because if you get 10 points versus they get 10 points, that's a shift of points because you'd rather they get the nine, you get the 10, then vice versa across as many things as possible. So you're trying to be mindful of a lot of things as you go through the game. And again, those special seat tiles keep it interesting, giving you a few special abilities, a few ways to get one past the rules as you go, but not nearly enough. You'll want seven VIP seats. You you can't have them, you only have one VIP seat, but you'll be trying to take advantage of how do I use my VIP and my backstage pass? How do I chain those all together to get the largest grouping of families I can possibly imagine to score as many points as I can as I play through this? And then plus plus, of course, the variable maps. The variable maps will give you more things to be mindful of in terms of you have the basic gameplay aspect, but then you have four different maps to explore, trying to use those same strategies and approaches, but mixing it up for different layouts as you go. Now, as far as things I don't like in the game, First of all, I don't think it works great at two. There's a small rules modification again around the this player screens and the hidden dice and whatnot. But I think overall two feels more back and forth. I find three and four is where you're gonna find more shine as far as and that's standard for area control to a large extent. There are area control games that work better at two or work well at two. For me, I found this one definitely shines at three and four players. So keep that in mind. It's not really so much thing that I don't like as something to be mindful of as you play. I'll say that's very non-intuitive, and I covered this in ease of play. It's very non-intuitive to explain and fully understand the game. Uh, end game scoring in particular feels like a complete surprise to people. When I play this game with people, even though I teach them everything I just taught you, the same thing I go through in the rules over here, I teach people that, there's a difference between hearing it and processing, processing it as you play. And I just find this is one of those games that the first game is almost a write-off. By the time you get to the end of the game, it's all starting to make sense. You get to end game scoring, you're like, oh, that's an additional thing that I know you told me, but I didn't really fully process. So I just really find this game is not that intuitive to explain and understand. And almost worse than that, I find that thematically, uh, first of all, I don't appreciate the music genre thematically. I'm not against it, but it doesn't pull me in. I don't really, I'm not, I mean, there are music games that I enjoy, but it's not a theme that pulls me in. But what's worse about that is to me, the theme doesn't even support the gameplay mechanics. Like just thematically speaking, the aspect of having things like, you know, you have a chain of families and hey, this guy over here, this percussion instrument can go ahead and be useful, can benefit from this stage because it's connected to the family. But this one can't. Why? Because it's not connected to the family. If it was connected to the family, you can. Like, I don't, I don't understand why that chaining exists thematically speaking so it's not just that I'm not into the theme it's that I don't find I think that there are many elements of the theme that are charming in terms of the presentation of the game of ooh, you're booking seats you're placing dice into those seats but then a lot of the rules don't actually support why that is the way it is why do you score points for the largest family why do other things so it is a theme that is charming in the way it's added to the game and in some elements makes sense but in other elements is just, I mean, it's just is what it is. It's a, it's a theme on mechanics, but not in a way that helps you enable the mechanics, if anything, in a way that is surprising because the mechanics don't line up with the theme, if that makes sense. As far as I can see, others not liking, 
first of all, you'll have your plans fall apart. People are going to get in your way. This is not a nice game. This is a mean. I mean, the theme is very nice and bebop and jazz. They have included playlists, by the way, which I love. The idea of having like, hey, here's some songs you can listen to while you play, like uh, some jazz background. I love the idea of that. But the practical reality is past that. The actual um, the, the the game itself is fairly mean. It, it, thematically, it's very light and fluffy, but it is a mean game of trying to take control of various areas, uh, booting other people's seats out, trying to go ahead and close an early score on something so that you can't get what they want. You are constantly trying to evaluate your own plans and see what other people's plans are and how can you achieve yours while frustrating theirs at the same time. This is not a light, fun, fluffy game. This is a mean, cutthroat strategy game. I'll say that having your dice not score at the end of the game can be frustrating. Some of your dice in the game will not actually help you. You'll place dice to surround stages, those stages will never be surrounded, and you'll just have a few dice that just didn't really score, which is just not as much fun as the rest of it. And there's a little bit of pick on the leader as, I, as you go through the game. I kind of touched upon this when I mentioned, like, don't use your special ability tiles too early because you might want to save them for when it's not just helping you but denying the leader points. This game definitely has that. You'll see people who are ahead in the game who are making progress better, and you will try to be combining with the other players to be like, well, I'm going to fight here and there, but at the very least, I may as well fight them because I want to deny them points not just the players who are in last place. So it does have a little bit of pick on the leader. You have to be okay with that in this game. As far as final thoughts on Bebop, I overall enjoyed the strategy that Bebop is presenting. I think there's a lot of strategy here. There's a fun tile laying game. It's got a beautiful charm, very unique presentation, a lot of solid things going on in the game. But for me, I find it's very Knizia in its feel, by the way. If you've played Knizia tile laying games, this very much feels like it's inspired by Knizia games. It has that feel. It has that strategy. It has that gameplay. But for me, the combination of the theme itself not being a theme that pulls me in, but also the more importantly, the non-intuitive gameplay, those definitely lose some marks for me on the game. It's one that I both appreciate the strong parts very much, while feeling that elements of it are, again, both in the teach, but even past that, it's not the most intuitive area control game I've played, despite being simpler on the rules. Uh, for me, this is a 3.5 out of 5. A lot that I enjoy, a few things not as much, but a 3.5 out of 5. As far as other game recommendations, first of all, uh, I mentioned Knizia already, but uh, going off of that, we have Babylonia. This very much had vibes of Babylonia in terms of the way things chain together through groups. I uh, very much appreciate that aspect in Babylonia and appreciate it here as well. Again, the music aspect a little less intuitive for me, but very much I think if you like one, you'll probably like the other. And then Through the Desert, if you're looking for a different kind of area control game, also from Rainer Knizia, that has different kinds of uh, closing off areas. Very different puzzle, but again, if you like one, I think there are a lot of things to like from uh, from those games. So Babylonia and Through the Desert from Rainer Knizia. In any case, and until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. Hope you enjoyed this video, and as always, I hope you have a good one.